ಈ ಸಭೆಯ ಸಂಚಾಲಕಿಯಾದ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶೈಲಜಾ ಹಿರೇಮಠ್ ಅವರಿಗೆ ಅತಿಥಿ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸಕರನ್ನು ವೇದಿಕೆಗೆ ಆಹ್ವಾನಿಸಲು ಕೊಡುತ್ತಾವುದೂ ಇಲ್ಲ ಭಾರತೀಯ ಜ್ಞಾನ ವ್ಯವಸ್ಥೆ ಮತ್ತು ಅಯೋಧ್ಯೆಯ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಕುರಿತು ಇನ್ನಷ್ಟು ತಿಳಿದುಕೊಳ್ಳಲು ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ವಿನಾಯಕ್ ರಜತ್ ಭಟ್ ಮತ್ತು ನೀನಾ ರಾಯ್ಜಿ ಅವರು ನಮ್ಮೊಂದಿಗಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಈ ಇಬ್ಬರು ಅತಿಥಿಗಳನ್ನು ನಿಮ್ಮ ಮುಂದೆ ಪರಿಚಯಿಸಲು ನನಗೆ ಹೆಮ್ಮೆ ಎನಿಸುತ್ತಿದೆ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ವಿನಾಯಕ್ ರಜತ್ ಭಟ್ ಇವರು ಬೆಂಗಳೂರಿನ ಚಾಣಕ್ಯ ವಿಶ್ವವಿದ್ಯಾಲಯದಲ್ಲಿ ಭಾರತೀಯ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಪರಂಪರೆ ಕೇಂದ್ರದಲ್ಲಿ ಸಹ ಪ್ರಾಧ್ಯಾಪಕರಾಗಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರು ಹನ್ನೊಂದು ವರ್ಷಗಳಿಗೂ ಹೆಚ್ಚು ಕಾಲದಿಂದ ಭಾರತೀಯ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಪರಂಪರೆ ವ್ಯಾಕರಣ ಆಯುರ್ವೇದ ಹಾಗೂ ಅರ್ಥಶಾಸ್ತ್ರ ವಿಷಯಗಳನ್ನು ಬೋಧಿಸುತ್ತಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಭಟ್ ಇವರಿಗೆ ವ್ಯಾಕರಣದಲ್ಲಿ ಅಭಿಜ್ಞ ಕೋವಿದ ಮತ್ತು ಚೂಡಾಮಣಿ ಪ್ರಶಸ್ತಿ ನೀಡಿ ಗೌರವಿಸಲಾಗಿದೆ ಇವರನ್ನು ಲಂಡನ್ನಿನ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಕಲೆಕ್ಷನ್ನ ಆಯುರ್ವೇದಿಕ್ ಮ್ಯಾನ್ ಎನ್ಕೌಂಟರ್ಸ್ ವಿತ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಮೆಡಿಸಿನ್ ಯೋಜನೆಗೆ ವಿಶೇಷ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತ ಸಲಹೆಗಾರರನ್ನಾಗಿ ನೇಮಿಸಲಾಗಿದೆ ಇವರು ಭಾರತೀಯ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಪರಂಪರೆಯ ಕುರಿತಾಗಿ ಅನೇಕ ಪ್ರ ಪುಸ್ತಕ ಮತ್ತು ಅನೇಕ ಪ್ರಬಂಧಗಳನ್ನು ಮಂಡಿಸಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಶ್ರೀಯುತರಿಗೆ ಹಾರ್ದಿಕ ಸ್ವಾಗತವನ್ನು ಕೋರುತ್ತೇವೆ ನಮ್ಮ ನಡುವೆ ಇರುವ ಇನ್ನೋರ್ವ ಅತಿಥಿಗಳು ನೀನಾ ರಾಯ್ಜಿ ಪುಣೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಜನಿಸಿದ ಈಗ ಇವರು ಈಗ ದೆಹಲಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ನೆಲೆಸಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರು ಪ್ರತಿಷ್ಠಿತ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಮಾಸ್ ಕಮ್ಯುನಿಕೇಷನ್ನ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿಯಾಗಿ ಸ್ನಾತಕೋತ್ತರ ಪದವಿಯನ್ನು ಪೂರ್ಣಗೊಳಿಸಿದ ನಂತರ ಅನೇಕ ವರ್ಷಗಳ ಕಾಲ ಮಧ್ಯಪ್ರಾಚ್ಯದಲ್ಲಿ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡಿ ಭಾರತಕ್ಕೆ ಹಿಂದಿರುಗಿದರು ಚಿತ್ರ ಕಲಾವಿದೆಯಾಗಿರುವ ಇವರು ಮಾಧ್ಯಮದಲ್ಲೂ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡಿದವರು ಪ್ರಸ್ತುತ ದೆಹಲಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಸ್ವಂತ ಉದ್ಯೋಗ ನಡೆಸುತ್ತಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರು ವಾಲ್ಮೀಕಿ ರಾಮಾಯಣವನ್ನು ಆಧರಿಸಿದ ಸಂಶೋಧನೆಯನ್ನು ಮಾಡಿ ಅಮೇಝಿಂಗ್ ಅಯೋಧ್ಯ ಎನ್ನುವ ಪುಸ್ತಕವನ್ನು ಬರೆದಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರಿಗೂ ಕೂಡ ಯುವ ಪ್ರಬುದ್ಧ ಭಾರತದ ಪರವಾಗಿ ಹಾರ್ದಿಕವಾಗಿ ಸ್ವಾಗತಿಸುತ್ತೇವೆ ಈ ಸಭೆಯನ್ನು ಮುನ್ನಡೆಸಲು ಕೆ ಎಲ್ ಎಸ್ ಐ ಎಂ ಎರ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ಸಹಾಯಕ ಪ್ರಾಧ್ಯಾಪಕಿಯಾದ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶೈಲಜಾ ಹಿರೇಮಠ್ ಅವರಲ್ಲಿ ಕೋರುತ್ತೇನೆ ಧನ್ಯವಾದಗಳು ಧನ್ಯವಾದ ಪ್ರಮೋದ್ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ವೆರಿ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ಫುಲ್ ಟು ಪ್ರಬುದ್ಧ ಭಾರತ್ ಫಾರ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟೆಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಮೀ ದಿಸ್ ಅಪಾರ್ಚುನಿಟಿ ಟು ಶೇರ್ ದ ಸ್ಟೇಜ್ ವಿತ್ ದ ಸಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಅಥಾರಿಟೀಸ್ ಆನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ವಿನಾಯಕ್ ಭಟ್ಜಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅಮೇಝಿಂಗ್ ಅಯೋಧ್ಯ ನೀನಾ ರಾಯ್ಜಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಮೈ ಪ್ರಿವಿಲೇಜ್ ಟು ಮಾಡ್ರೇಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಟೇಕಿಂಗ್ ಫಾರ್ವರ್ಡ್ ವಾಟ್ ನಂದಕುಮಾರ್ಜಿ ಸೆಡ್ ಇನ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಇಯರ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ತ್ರೀ ಈಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ಇಯರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ಭಾರತೀಯಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯು ಬೀಯಿಂಗ್ ಯುವ ಇನ್ ಸ್ಪೆಸಿಫಿಕ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ಸ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ದ ಹೋಸ್ಟ್ ಟು ಜಿ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಸಮಿಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅಂಡರ್ ದ ಪ್ರೆಸಿಡೆನ್ಸಿ ಆಫ್ ಆರ್ ಆನರೇಬಲ್ ಪ್ರೈಮ್ ಮಿನಿಸ್ಟರ್ ನರೇಂದ್ರ ಮೋದಿ ಜಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಅಪಾರ್ಚುನಿಟಿ ಫಾರ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ಭಾರತೀಯಸ್ ಅಸ್ ಟು ಶೋಕೇಸ್ ಭಾರತ್ ಇನ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ನ್ಯೂ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಸೊ ವೆನ್ ಐ ಸೇ ನ್ಯೂ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ವಾಟ್ ಡಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಮೀನ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ವಸುಧೈವ ಕುಟುಂಬ ಕುಟುಂಬಕಮ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ದ ಥೀಮ್ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಏನ್ಷಿಯನ್ ಡೇಸ್ ಬಟ್ ದ ಥೀಮ್ ವಸುಧೈವ ಕುಟುಂಬಕಮ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಬೀನ್ ಸ್ಪೆಸಿಫಿಕ್ಲಿ ಚೋಸನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಜಿ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಸೆಮಿಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಡ್ರಾನ್ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ಏನ್ಷಿಯನ್ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತ್ ಟೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಮಹಾ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ಸ್ ಕಾನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಅ ಇಂಟಿಗ್ರಲ್ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆರ್ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಪರಂಪರ and including myself and many of us in this audience especially the yuva may or may not have heard about all these things upanishads and other things and this is the platform where you are
Um, I would uh, now request Dr. Vinayakji to please take over. Agajanana Padmarkam Gajanana Maharnisham Anekadantam Bhaktana Mekadantam Upasmahe Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makaschid Dukkha Bhag Bhavet Namas Sabhai Sabhayam Upasthita Abhyaha Nina Rai Varya Abhyaha Shailaja Varya Abhyaha Purataha Upasthita Abhyaha Vidva Abhyaha Yu Abhyascha Pranamaha so the topic given to me is to discuss with you about Indian knowledge systems. So when I was, uh, I am actually thankful to the organizers who invited me to speak on this arena where the great speakers are already speaking a lot. And uh, it was, my situation was like that after Sachin Tendulkar got out, Dravid is coming in. So I was wondering whether after listening to Nanda Kumarji, whether there will be people here in front of me to listen to me. But I am lucky that still students are here to listen. So the, I was thinking what to speak, because Indian knowledge system is a vast ocean. In this ocean, how to start? Still today morning, this was my situation, how to start? But the organizers arranged uh, the hospitality for me at one home. Uh, it was a school, it a school and home combined together. It's just like a Gurukula. Like Guru is staying inside the campus. The name of the school is Kamadhenu, it's nearby. So usually what happens when somebody is invited, they are usually taken to the hotel. Some hotel, their arrangement is done in a hotel and some hotel food comes and we eat that hotel food, get our tummy disturbed. The next day we have to suffer with our stomach. So these type of things happen. But luckily, the arrangement was so beautiful. So what I understood, Indian knowledge system is not, is not just a documentation of some books, but it's a practice. When something comes in, that practice we still have. It's rooted. When the root is strong, the tree survives for long. So our root of knowledge is very strong. That's why we, the, our civilization or our knowledge is still surviving compared to the other civilization, 45 and more civilization, which got destroyed. We are still surviving because of our roots. Now, uh, so I got the uh, topic to start with. So I will start with one concept of Indian knowledge system. Then we will try to understand what Indian knowledge system is. One, I have taken one topic. Okay, so may we go to our next slide? So this is the question for you. What is the logic behind weekdays? Can anybody? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Any logic can you present in your school texts or in your college text? Was it presented? Every day we we use this. Okay, in our day-to-day -day life, we are using what is Sunday. We are using Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. But do you know what is the logic behind it? Was it ever taught to you? In our school, when I was in school, it was not there. So I never knew what is the logic behind it. But in our Indian system, we have a very pure logic when we say, so, Bhanu Vasaraha or Ravi Vasaraha, Soma Vasaraha, Mangalavar, Budhavar, Guruvar, Shukravar, Shanivar, Ivaragalan Helutta, so we have a logic for that. What is that logic? It is given in Surya Siddhanta as well as Arya Bhatiya, the text written by Arya Bhata, as well as there is text called Surya Siddhanta for which author is unknown because uh, there are many texts for which authors are not known. But there is one text called Surya Siddhanta for which also author is not known. So can we have our next slide? So, uh, Sorry for the font disturbance, but Mandama Rejya Bhu Putra Surya Shukrendu Jendavaha. So this is the first line, which says earlier in ancient India, we used to consider earth as a center, not because we didn't know that sun is the center. In all the texts, it's mentioned that sun is in the, at the center. But for some calculations, we need to keep earth as a center. If we don't keep it, the calculation may go, go wrong. 
because we are calculating from our perspective, not from the sun's perspective. Remember that thing. So to understand that, we had to keep the Earth as a center. So it is believed. So they wanted to divide these seven days. So how to do it? So it is believed that at the, when the this Srishti, when this creation happened, the first thing which was seen was sun. Okay. So that day they decided it to make it as a Ravi Vasara. Now every day there are 24 horas, hora, hour, which we say now. These days we have a translation called hour. It's hora. So for each hora, one graha or one planet was given as a adhipatya, a leadership, Swami. So morning, every morning, whatever hora we see, Hora means at the lagna, means at the kshitija, what you call, uh, if you divide the earth, where the sun actually rises, so that part. So there, whatever graha is seen, so that graha will be leader of that day. Okay, that's how it is considered. So see, uh, you can see Surya there. In front of Surya, I have kept one. So let us count till 24. One, two, three. One is Surya, two is Shukra, three is Buddha, four is Soma. 5, 6, 7, 8. So Buddha is 24. So 24 hours are over. Next is 25th. 25th hour is Soma. Soma is Somavara. This is the law. Now how come this, uh, uh, why this is kept in this manner? Shani, Guru, Kuja, Surya, Shukra. Why is it not Sunday, Somavara, Mangalavara, Soma, Mangala, Buddha and all? So when we keep earth as a center, you can see that picture there. So when we keep Earth as a center, you will find that Shani is at the end, the slowest, even now we see, you know, the slowest uh, planet which revolve around the sun. So you can see Shani, after that you have Guru, then you have Shukra, Ravi, Buddha and all. So this is how if you keep the Earth as a center, you will find these planets around in this manner. Keeping this as a uh, base of finding the weekdays, so 24 hours when you count from here, you will get 25th hour the next day as Soma. Now from Soma you start counting, 1, 2, 3 and all, then you will get Kuja. Kuja means Mangala. You can just note this Krama in your book and you do the practice, you will get the weekdays. So we have a logical explanation for finding out the weekdays. Based on this we have come up with the weekdays. Now it's just generally because of some names we have kept it. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, no. We have a proper reasoning for it. Fine. So just as an example, I wanted to show how beautiful Indian knowledge, Indian knowledge we have. Unless we study it and understand it, it will be difficult to make uh, proper meaning from that. Anyway, so uh, I will not go to next slide. I will jump to further slide. Can we do that? No, please jump it. I don't want this. OK. So what is Indian knowledge system? There is one great university called WhatsApp University where a lot of knowledge is being shared. So in that knowledge, many knowledge are myths. About Indian knowledge system, when we talk about Indian knowledge system, there are many myths which are going around. Even I get many times in my WhatsApp, I get that, do you know this information about Indian knowledge system? So some some fact, they are saying it as a fact, but they are usually myths. So we'll see some myths and we'll see what are the facts about that. Because you are youth, you are going to take care about this uh, Indian knowledge system. Sorry to say you, we. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm also youth. We all are youth here. So it's always good to say we instead of saying you. But yeah, so there are some myths. One first myth is IKS is a discipline, subject, specialization. Whenever we are treated like that, that's why I know. In universities when we go, sir, what is your specialization, IKS? How can IKS be a specialization? Arts, when we say arts, or when we say science, or uh, in arts, if some, can we say somebody is a specialized, speciali somebody has a specialization in arts? No, because arts has several other fields. The person who is a scholar of psychology cannot be the scholar of economics. Maybe, 
that depends upon his intellect but it's very difficult to be a, a person to be scholar of all the discipline art does not mean one discipline similarly iks is not a discipline it's not a specialization though ugc has come up with a net in iks but we don't actually accept that part because if iks becomes a specialization or discipline it will be very difficult for the people who are actually studying iks some it will be like a khichdi thoda sa yahan se thoda sa wahan se thoda sa yahan se kuch puchoge to kuch pata nahi sir so that should not happen but anyway to encourage the study of iks yeah we need to sometimes we have to uh, <laughs> uh, we have to take such thoughts anyway but this is what the fact is iks is a label given to a collection of interconnected disciplines there are many disciplines when we bring that together it becomes in whatever knowledge is grown in india is indian whatever knowledge is uh, actually it may not be only indians who have contributed sometimes the people who came from other places stayed here and developed the hindutva thought or indian thought and then they created some book knowledge that knowledge is also indian knowledge okay we'll go to our next slide is it not in a way of uh, ppt oh okay okay the next is iks is sanskrit so the person who knows sanskrit he knows indian knowledge system there is another myth which we have i am as a sanskrit person people are asking me whatever they want to resolve from the indian knowledge system i was travelling in a train just one example i want to give i was travelling in a train i was still puc second year or degree first year at that time i was travelling in a train a person in front of me asked bete tum kya pad rahe ho i said sir uh, main sanskrit pad raha acha लो मेरा हाथ देखो <laughs> सर मैं संस्कृत में व्याकरण पढ़ रहा तो ज्योतिष नहीं जानते अरे संस्कृत जानते और ज्योतिष नहीं जानते बोलते फिर क्या संस्कृत पढ़ रहे हो देर इज अनदर सच सिचुएशन विच आई राइट आई वॉज इन वन टेम्पल एंड वन पूजा री वॉज परफॉर्मिंग पूजा सो वाइल ही वॉज रेंडरिंग सम वर्सेस आई ऑल्सो स्टार्टेड रेंडरिंग वर्सेस विद हिम ही केम टू मी एंड सेट सर आप तो बहुत कुछ जानते हो इन कन्ड ही सैट निम्हे तुम गए बी नम देवस्थान पोजिशन बर्ती रहा निम्बे अपॉइंटमेंट मास्ती मतलब मुझे वहाँ पूजारी के रूप में बुलाए सर मैंने बोला मैं तो व्याकरण पढ़ता हूँ तो क्या संस्कृत पढ़ते हो कि नहीं संस्कृत मतलब सब जानता है प्लीज स्पैर दिस संस्कृत लैंग्वेज पीपल वी आर नॉट सर्वज्ञास सो आई के एस इज संस्कृत दिस इज वन मिथ एंड आई के एस इज डन बाय संस्कृत पीपल नो संस्कृत इज वन ऑफ द लैंग्वेजेस एज इंग्लिश कन्नडा सो डू यू द पर्सन हु इज स्टडिंग इंग्लिश लिटरेचर कैन ही टीच केमिस्ट्री कैन ही टीच केमिस्ट्री नो कैन ही टीच साइकोलॉजी then how can one expect a sanskrit person to teach all these subjects so this is another myth which is surrounding i have faced a lot of consequences because of this because i am a sanskrit but that's my duty now to reveal the fact so sanskrit is a language one can use it in any end it so happens that lot of works in iks are available in sanskrit because of the uh, richness of the language the language can create many new words in sanskrit we have a uh, special power called paninian grammar which survived for last 2500 years which actually helps in creating new words because of create uh, because of the power of creation of new words any subject can create new technical words so that is the beauty that's why till 18th century or uh, till 18th century sanskrit was the powerful language used for all the subjects or sciences but later on english took over and now we have all the subjects in english that's all language changed subjects are still same science philosophy psychology engineering everything is there only the language changed so sanskrit does not mean iks sanskrit is a part of iks okay next slide please iks is ancient <laughs> whenever we offer this course sir ye purani ye ye bhai indian the hame kyun padha rahe hum to engineering students hain 
हम टेक्नोलॉजी स्टूडेंट्स हैं हम कॉमर्स स्टूडेंट्स हैं हम क्या करेंगे इसका इसका क्या आचार डालेंगे दिस क्वेश्चन आई एक्चुअली एक्चुअली आई हर्ड दिस फ्रॉम माई स्टूडेंट्स सो आई के एस इस एंशियंट सो आई सी इफ यू आर क्रिएटिंग ए न्यू नॉलेज टूडे इन इंडिया यू आर एन इंडियन यू आर क्रिएटिंग ए न्यू नॉलेज वाट दैट नॉलेज विल बी कॉल्ड अमेरिकन ऑस्ट्रेलियन वाट विल इट बी कॉल्ड देन हाउ इज इट एंशियंट टूमोरो यू विल बी क्रिएटिंग ए न्यू नॉलेज विल दैट बी अमेरिकन और ऑस्ट्रेलियन नो दैट विल ऑल्सो बी इन इंडिया इफ यू आर क्रिएटिंग इट इन इंडिया यू आर एन इंडियन यू आर यूजिंग इंडियन थाट्स देन इट विल बी इंडियन so that's the another myth which we are facing iks is ancient okay can we go to next slide iks is written by hindus now this depends how do you take the word hindu if you t there are two understandings about the word hindu one the whole akhanda bharata sindhu we call it hindu so whoever stays here are hindu does not matter which religion he belongs to he is a hindu so this is one perspective where we can take the word hindu as another perspective where uh, of the word hindu is the religion ye hindu hai ye islam ye muslim hai wagera wagera so now depends what do you mean by the word hindus if you take that we understand the word hindu as a geographical land where people live Sindhu civilization or Hindu civilization, Hindu Twa. Then, even the there are contributions by Jainas, Buddhas, Islams, Jaina and Buddha. Anyhow, they are part of Hindu because the theories or philosophies which they use, they have Hindu to background in that. But Islam, they have also contributed. So even those texts will come under IKS. But if you say this only Hindu thing. then even we have to say no it's not only hindu who have cont if you take hindu as a religion then we have to say that hindu no, it's not only hindus who have contributed for this even the buddhas jainas and islams even some uh, at some places christians were have been the part of the contribution team for indian knowledge system next iks is mainly spiritualism as i said when i went to mandir they asked me to be the pujari or the usually what happens when people see that uh, i am from a indian knowledge system background they start most of the time they start speaking with me vedanta because their understanding maybe their understanding is indian knowledge system or sanskrit is only for spiritualism but see you can get the huge list i have given here linguistics astronomy health sciences mathematics poetry metallurgy and several other sciences can be found in indian knowledge system one example i have shown about astronomy i wanted to show many example but time is very limited first thing which i want to is make you understand what is myth and what is fact otherwise there are lot of which i can give from indian knowledge system yeah so indian knowledge system is not a mere spiritual yeah spiritualism is there it's just a small part of that even when we speak about vedas most of the time the people think that it's a religious text bhagavad gita it's a religious text you know what the uh, professor b mahadevan from iimb bangalore he uses the bhagavad gita as a management text he takes one course on it bhagavad gita and management so bhagavad gita is not a mere spiritual yeah it depends bhagavad gita can be interpreted in many ways so as a student if you want to take it's like a guru to you for management people it's a managing management text for philosophers it's a philosophical text so spiritual spiritual people spiritual text so it depends how you see in see towards the text similarly vedas are like that there is only a small part of veda which discuss about spirituality otherwise there are a lot of other things which we need to decode from the vedas okay next yeah i can become an expert in iks they are iks experts i am called as iks experts now which is a myth okay no one person can become an expert in iks because iks is not a discipline if you ask me anything about science i don't know 
what science what science have you studied well, maths the most difficult subject for anybody okay if you come and ask sir uh, you are you have you are the expert of iks please teach me leelavati i cannot teach leelavati leelavati is a mathematical text written by uh, bhaskar acharya so if you ask me sir t i am a math student so you are iks expert no please support me i, I want to write a research in mathematics how can i support i am not the expert of mathematics ha kam vyakarana you ask arthashastra of kautilya you ask i can help but not with this aspect so this is another myth which we find. next ha this is the most uh, humorous thing which we face iks has answer to all the problems of life whatsapp message ha huh? iks has answer to all the problems of our life our ancient teachers have given us all the solutions now my mobile got ruined will my ancient text answer the answer for this problem what do you think will answer no because it was not there at that time we have to understand the limitation of indian knowledge system we cannot just merely say keep on saying that indian knowledge system has just because we are very proud yeah we are proud we are proud that we are indians and we have such a great tradition of knowledge but that does not mean everywhere where we go we keep saying that we have answer for all the problems it depends what type of problem you have so depending upon the problem sometimes we may have answer sometimes we may not have sometimes we may have indirect answers for something so that depends okay so our intellectual ancestors tried to answer the problems which were prevalent in their times hence it does not have answers to all the questions okay okay so what is indian knowledge system when we uh, i have already said that indian knowledge system means any knowledge which came which existed now which we are creating or what will we be whatever we will be creating in future will be indian knowledge which will be created in india with indian methodologies in mind that we have to keep in mind indian methodologies if we use western methods give our knowledge that will be mixed version but if we use our own methods and give the knowledge then that will be indian knowledge okay so uh, akhanda bharata was the concept unless if we don't take akhanda bharata as a concept we cannot say paninian grammar was ours we can never say mahabhashya of patanjali was ours there are many texts which actually we actually respect those texts till this date though they have left it the pa paninis paninis grammar panini was from lahur in pakistan patanjali was from afghanistan so if we say india is just this geographical part then we cannot call panini sastadhyayi or patanjali mahabhashya or yoga sutra as indian texts we have to call them afghanistan text we are studying so in this context we are taking india as a indian as a long tradition anyway we'll skip all those things. knowledge and system definitions you know so indian i wanted to make clear what does india word indian mean okay, can we go ahead yeah the indian civilization modern western civilization it's about 5000 to 8000 what modern or western say about indian uh, civilization they call it it's uh, older than 5000 or 8000 years uh, means they restrict themselves only to 5000 to 8000 years but it's more uh, you have to go even beyond that indigenous sources and belief systems a very ancient period almost time immemorial we cannot say we cannot actually identify in what time the rigveda was actually uh, uh, seen by the rishis because it was a it was actually seen or heard shruti we say because it's a rishi means rishayo mantra drashtaraha those who see the mantras so mantras were seen and they were transferred orally so oral system was there and for the protection of that many vikruti pathas were constructed those are different uh, uh, way different topic which can be discussed later whenever we have another session on this and a country with a long surviving civil civilizational history ought to have accumulated knowledge over its long period of existence some examples like wood steel so the very beautiful example which was uh, used for damascus blades the sword 
and it was actually imp uh, exported from India for many years. Later, when British came, they uh, blocked it. They said that uh, because of this, India is growing, and we, do we don't want to allow India to grow. So because of that, they stopped mining. They stopped the knowledge which was being shared. They brought a new education system. And because of this new education system, we started degrading our own selves. Even now, because of the education system, I have been experiencing when students come into class, they don't like Indian knowledge system course. Because they feel that it's Indian. We never knew anything what these people are going to teach. But after few hours of classes, few sessions, they start believing, oh yeah, we had a lot of things which we never knew. So that is important. We have to understand what is ours, what we are. That is not given in, uh, till now it was not there, but uh, soon because of NEP, everyone will come to know what we are. So we'll go to our next slide. Okay, so this is some hard facts which we are facing. Uh, what is it? Uh, please tell me when time is up. How much time I more I have? Five minutes? Okay. If it's a huge thing, so wherever the five minutes gets over, I'll stop there. Okay, so please uh, bear with me. What is it? Some people say it's a mythology, nothing other than God, religion, religious per, uh, prescriptions, long lists of do's and don'ts, matters of bind faith, science, meta science. These are the beliefs which we usually find about Indian knowledge system. Where is it? Almost extinct. Nahi hai, kuch bacha nahi hai, sab khatam ho gaya. Incomprehensible, uninteresting. अरे इसमें क्या है सब boring है. इतिहास क्यों पढ़ा रहे हैं हमें? History school में भी boring था, college में भी boring है, भविष्य में boring रहेगा. This is what the mentality we have. But what happens, you know, when you reach the age of forty, you will start liking history. And then you will say, sir, we want Indian knowledge book. Can you provide? Can we have some books for us? But it's always better to start from now. Instead of searching after 40th age. Okay. So, too difficult to call out. This is not going to be able to do it. We don't know what we are doing. We are not going to be able to do We take Indian knowledge system as. Next slide, please. Why do we need it? Useful for chanting mantras, for rituals. This is one thought. Mere unqualified glorification of. हमारा बड़प्पन दिखाना है, कॉलर उठाना है, इसीलिए हमें इंडियन नॉलेज सिस्टम पढ़ना है। This is the another thought which we have. No material gains, कुछ इससे कुछ मिलने वाला नहीं। These three are very important. What we hear from the society, इसको पढ़ने से पैसा मिलेगा? नहीं मिलेगा। Will it provide two meals a day for a poor? This question was actually asked to Professor Mahadevan ji, so I took it from him. Okay? This question was asked to him. Will it provide two meals a day for a poor? So what answer he gave, that I will give here. He told that person, will your satellite give two meals for a poor? Thousands of satellites you have built. Will it give two meals a day for a poor? Then why are you building? Sir, indirectly it gives. Yeah, indirectly IKS also gives. Simple. That was the answer. Will the society be any better? Something useful exists, but we can always translate them. Sanskrit kyu padna hai uske liye? Translate kar lenge. But you know there is a complication with translation. Uh, though that example is not here, I will take that example. Uh, in Veda there is one mantra. I don't remember the mantra, but uh, it says, Yadva, Yadvai Sahasram Gavaha. Uh, Gau, the word Gau you know? What is the meaning of that? Very good. I wanted this meaning. Okay. The word Translator translated the mantra is like this: uh, When thousand gows are kept one above another, okay, thousand cows when kept one above another, it gives the distance between the earth and the sun. So, what is the what can be the maximum height of a cow? I cannot hear you loudly. Four to five feet. I will take ten feet. Let's take in that time when Rugveda was uh, Rugveda was heard, it might have been ten feet. Ten into thousand. 
10,000. Is the distance between Earth and the Sun is 10,000 feet? No. Then Vedas, it, say, it is said in Veda. So is Veda correct? No. That's what one person translated without reading a text called Nirukta. There is a text called Nirukta which gives the synonyms for the difficult words or ununderstandable words of the Vedas. So for the word Prithivi, Earth, there are 29, 21 synonyms given in Nirukta. One of the synonyms for the word Earth is Gau. Now, take the circumference of the Earth, multiply it by 1000, and search the Google. You will get the distance between Sun and the Earth. So the translator, he is a Western translator. He never studied this Nirukta. You must understand one thing, the person who knows Sanskrit cannot understand, it's, it's not important, it's not, uh, it, it's not true that he will understand all the Vedas. V the language of Veda is totally different from the language in other texts. We have to understand that. So that person knew Sanskrit, so he thought I can translate, he translated it, and this blunder happened. And because the people who study that translation, they actually are considering Vedas as a wrong book to study. Okay? Yeah. Can we go? So this is the what we uh, we find the problem with the translations. So we should not always rely on the translations. We should also try to go to the originality or original books. Uh, how much time I might be having? Time is up. So I will wind up, sorry. So one more thing. Uh, can we go to our next slide? One thing I wanted to present. Yeah, this one. So what is the importance of IKS Indian knowledge system? These four. One is identity. For our identity, we need Indian knowledge. Next, culture. To protect our culture, to lead this civilization for more many thousand millennium years. OK? Then next. To protect our, to have the received wisdom, to create new wisdom, you have to have old wisdom. Why to create new every time? Why to start from scratch? When you already have some knowledge, use that knowledge and build new knowledge instead of starting from scratch. So the, for that purpose, I, I, Indian knowledge system is important and economic value. I'll give one example. Neem. We have been using neem for several Medicine, because it has several medicinal properties, but we never documented it. So what US did, US, they worked for some few years, and they found that there are some medicinal properties in it. They took the patent for the neem. Be you know what happens when somebody takes the patent? Whenever we use neem here, we have to pay to that country. So the neem is ours. We have been knowing neem for several millennium years. We have been using it for herbal, uh, for medicinal properties. But because we didn't have patent, now we are paying. Vedas are now patent for Germany. This is the situation. Our problem is we never understood our uh, wisdom, and we could not use it to make the patent. Similarly, it happened for turmeric also, but we fought and bought it back. Now India is really working. So what happened? The problem is not that India never had this knowledge. We were actually, what happened with us? It was covered from Kichad. Kichad se dhag gaya tha ye pura. Now this, it's not that present government is bringing new knowledge. It's just removing the Kichad from that no, from whatever is covered. Now, shuddh jal se hum usko dho rahe hain. Aur knowledge bahar a raha hai. धोने में हम लोगों को उनका हेल्प तो करना पड़ेगा सिर्फ गवर्नमेंट कुछ नहीं कर पाएगी जब तक हम लोग कुछ नहीं करेंगे कुछ नहीं होगा सो दिस इज द थिंग व्हिच आई वांटेड टू प्रेजेंट देयर आर लॉट इट्स अ बिग ओशियन वी कैन नॉट पुट एवरीथिंग इन 20 मिनट्स सो थैंक यू फॉर गिविंग मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी एंड आई होप आई कुड शेयर समथिंग विद यू धन्यवाद Dhanyavadagalu, Dr. Vinayak Bhatji Orge. I think the youth can connect to something that I'll just draw from his example. He was talking about turmeric and the patents and other things. So what we usually do, you know, uh, if mother gives 
a turmeric milk, milk with turmeric, if we are not well, right? We may not drink it, right? So we may say that we will have some antibiotic or something like that. We go to something which is already we are practicing. But if some multinational company comes with la turmeric latte or something like that, we are ready to pay for it, right? We are ready to pay for it and have it with a lot of joy and also associate status with the drink that we are going to have. So I just try to um, summarize in a sense uh, to connect to the next session. Uh, Bhatji said, Indian knowledge system is more to do with the identity, economic value, culture and received wisdom. Right? So every civilization across the world has an identity of its own. Be it is in terms of the city itself, the Rome, the Greeks, and other civilizations do have a strong identity. So do we have an identity of that sort where we proudly say, this is our identity, and proudly associate ourselves with a culture, and also the economic value, what we have been receiving in terms of the wisdom through that identity. So the next speaker, Nina Raiji, is going to deliberate on such wonderful identity that is Ayodhya. So is it that we can identify ourselves, Ayodhya being our cultural identity, or a Itihasa identity? So how do we want to see Ayodhya? Because she has written a wonderful book on amazing Ayodhya. So many of us have heard the word Ayodhya as a city, and we associate many different things as we hear in today's time. But she has researched about the city and here she has brought out a wonderful book, what Re Ayodhya really means for us Bharatiyas. So let me uh, quickly pass on the session to Dr. Uh, Nina Raiji. So kindly please stay. Good morning. Um, so my topic is, why is Ayodhya amazing and its relevance today? So I, uh, for many years I studied Sanskrit and I did a lot of research. And in all the research, so whenever somebody studies Sanskrit, you also have to study texts like Valmiki Ramayan or the Mahabharat. And uh, as a Vishnu Bhakt, as a Vaishnav, um, and as a devotee of Bhagwan Ram and Mata Sita, I chose to study the Valmiki Ramayan. When I started studying the Valmiki Ramayan, I realized that the description that they gave of Ayodhya was stupendous. It was amazing. Um, there were many, many reasons. Uh, there were many things that helped me decode uh, what they were writing. Uh, to be honest, one shloka of Valmiki Ramayan can be the topic of PhD for somebody. It is that deep. <clears throat> so I wrote a book called Amazing Ayodhya because I thought it was just too amazing just to keep it to myself and it was my joy that I wanted to share with everybody. So the book is outside and if anybody, and, and I'm not going to, it, it is, you should not take my word for it that Ayodhya is amazing, you should actually read it to know why it is amazing. It is on the stall, um, you know, it is placed on the stall outside. Before talking about this topic, why is Ayodhya amazing? I want to ask the audience one or two questions, especially the young ones out here. Can anybody tell me the oldest tree in Belgavi? Does anybody in the audience, the young children, know about the oldest tree in Belgavi? Anybody? No? Okay. Does anybody uh, know about the oldest tree in their garden or around the garden? You know about the oldest tree around your house? Just give me an answer, anybody. I'm happy to, any tree, any tree around anything. Tell me, you're smiling. Tell me the oldest tree that you know. Yeah? It's a mango tree. Okay. So do you, uh, um, uh, so on that mango tree, are there birds that come there? Are there, okay. So tell me what comes there, birds? 
monkeys, squirrels, butterflies, bees, snakes sometimes? Yeah, some. Sometimes, yeah. right? OK. Um, do you know uh, who put the, who, who planted that tree? No, I'm. You don't know? No, you don't know. OK. So this is the issue. Uh, this is the problem. And um, <clears throat> in this scenario, if you picturize this scenario, here the most important facet of that scenario, apart from the, the tree and you know who, who has made the tree the home, is the fact who planted that tree. Because the person who planted that tree did it in a selfless act of service. And that selfless act has led you to enjoy it, right? So the birds are enjoying it, the bees are enjoying it, the butterflies. You know, they come on the manjari of the arm, uh, you know, arm ki manjari. It's so famous, it's used in poetry. So everybody but the person who planted this tree is enjoying it, right? Right? OK. So we too, today, are exactly the same. We are like the birds, all of us. And I'm talking of all of us here. We are like the birds, the squirrels, the bees, the butterflies, which take refuge in that tree. So why is this? important. So when I talk of a tree, it's very tangible. It's right in front of you. You can touch it. You can see it. You can eat the mango. You can see the butterfly, right? It's exciting. But for the indigenous people of this country, that tree that supports us is our culture. We are here today, successful, thriving, beautiful, prosperous because of our culture our Sanatan Dharma and our Sanskriti. OK, can you make the correlation between the two? And long ago, hidden in the dust of time, there was a man who sowed the seeds for us natives to blossom in this land. Can anybody tell me the name of that man? I heard something. Ikshwaku. Nearly, very close. <laughs> Anybody, any other, any other guess? Okay, so you're very close. Nine out of 10 to you, okay? So that man is Manu. So who is Manu? Manu is the progenitor of the human species. And by the progenitor of the human species, I mean the homo sapiens. We all are homo sapiens. Earth is now totally covered with homo sapiens. We are homo sapiens. We are what we call either manav or man. Incidentally, the word man in English etymology comes from the word manu. And you said Ikshwaku, right? So Ikshwaku was the eldest son of Manu. And he was the one who inherited the earth from him. OK, so he was the, so you're, you're this close, OK? Um, manu is the man the progenitor of the human species, the father of all Manavs. We are all Manavs, correct? We are not Rakshas, we are Manav. He's the father. And so he is the one who establishes Ayodhya. Therefore, Ayodhya then becomes one of the most important cities on Earth. And who is Manu? There are going to be total of 14 Manus. Today, we are living in the era of the seventh Manu, the seventh Manvantar. And the Manu that we have today, his name is Vaswat Manu. In the Valmiki Ramayana itself, it is stated, Manu na manav indren ya puri nirmata swayam. What does this mean? Manu na manav indren. Manavo me jo indra hai, wo manu hai. Aur unhone swayam hi. Is Ayodhya ko basaya hai. So what is Ayodhya? Ayodhya is the first city, the first capital, the first district that is uh, constructed by the progenitor of the human race, Manu himself. So what does that mean to us? It means that who we are, what we are today, 
all our roots for this manvantar specially lie in ayodhya and in the dust of time we have forgotten its importance but not anymore i am here with my book so that you all can learn about it again and feel the pride right what i want to also add is that ayodhya is not just a city with ram with a with a ram temple there it is a root it is our main root it is our sanskriti our culture it has the roots of this manvantar in it are the roots of our manvantar in it is there it is the seed of our civilization it is the home of some of the greatest kings of this soil whether you want to um you know uh, think of ram bhagwan as the one of the greatest kings or raja sagar or um, asit or a uh, bhagirathi who got ganga sagar who expanded the ocean they all come in the lineage of manu from ikshvaku they start from ikshvaku they come uh, bhagwan ram himself is a direct descendant of manu and after the birth of bhagwan ram therefore ayodhya became a place of absolute prime importance and these are some kings who work absolutely and selflessly for the betterment of this land and our people and 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 from whom we have inherited and they worked and so everybody who works doesn't only work for themselves they also work for the future especially the kings and we are grateful to these kings that they worked for for us this amongst many other reasons is the reason why ayodhya is amazing and ayodhya is relevant today because it is a root and it is a root of our civilization so as per the topic i'm going to give you five reasons why ayodhya is relevant today and five reasons why ayodhya is amazing there may be many more reasons but time is very limited and so i'm going to start with why is ayodhya relevant today so ayodhya is like i said our root from where we all began from where we all came it is also a part of our itihas if the roots of any tree are weak and pay attention to this and start noticing it um, in daily life as well if the roots of any tree are weak the tree never grows properly it does not neither does it flower well nor does it fruit well and if it is such a case there will be no monkeys there will be no butterflies there will be no squirrels and it will be a useless tree which gives refuge to nobody and nobody even wants it right therefore knowing our roots is very important because it tells us who we are the roots give us our identity so this is the first factor why is ayodhya relevant today because from it we derive our identity and why is identity important in itihas or history um or or why is our itihas important why is our history important because unless we know where we are coming from and who we are we will not know where we are going and where we are supposed to go a tree a prosperous tree a tree that grows up or grows wide or grows massive is a tree that has deep roots and its roots are alive and functioning and this is the importance of both itihas and ayodhya ayodhya is the root of sanatan and therefore it is our duty as sanatanis to know about it as indians to know about it and as hindus to know about it whether you want to take hindus as an identity a religious identity whether you want to take hindus as a geographical identity that is up to you the second reason is that we should be grateful that we exist and not only do we exist but we thrive as a people we thrive as a civilization and it is only because of the people who were before us and who laid the foundation for it the land that we live on this land this punya bhumi called bharat is not an ordinary land 
whether we take the biography of kings, whether we take the history of our freedom fighters, whether we take, whether we read about kings who, um, you know, stopped invasions, whether we look at our freedom fighters who, uh, who fought the British, remember that this land is irrigated by sacrifice and the blood of people who were before us. What we have got is irrigated by blood, not water. And therefore, each one of us has to be very grateful that we are born here, we can practice our, our Sanatan Dharam, we can, we can be free, we can thrive, because of all the numerous kings and the freedom fighters who lived before us and who have given us our freedom today. We, can, we are free men today, right? It is all because of these people. Coming from Manu, Till today, all the people who came, who sacrificed, who gave their blood for this land for, for, uh, on which we live and thrive, we have to be grateful for them. This is what Ayodhya tells us to. The third thing is, why is Ayodhya relevant today? Because it is pertinent to learn from the past to be able to recognize clear warning signs. Ayodhya teaches us to learn from past atrocities against us. All the genocides, the wars, the attacks. Repeatedly they have happened on Ayodhya, on our soil, on, uh, on India, right? Through this collective suffering, and I'm saying it is collective suffering, because if somebody is suffering in New Day, if, if you know, India is attacked from the borders in 1962 war, in the, in the, in the you know, 1971 war, collectively India suffered, right? When we were under domination by the British, we all collectively suffered, whether it was the Mughals, whether it was the British. So we have to learn from this collective suffering. We have to pay attention to the warning signs leading up to such atrocities. Knowing what leads to such attacks and events and various wars helps us better prepare for our future. So Ayodhya teaches us to understand and formulate Shatru Bodh. Unless you understand and have the wisdom of Shatru Bodh, it will be very difficult for you to understand who will come next to kill us. Or to even see and understand who is Shatru. And the Shatru not necessarily needs to be outside. The Shatru could be one of us also. Then the fourth point that Ayodhya, why it is relevant, relevant today, is that it teaches us perseverance. It gives us this concept of, uh, you know, and, and what is perseverance? Perseverance is marching towards a goal, goal, and to a large extent, from Ayodhya, what I gathered was never forget, never forget, and never forgive. Because Hindus persevered for more than 500 years, that is why today we have a temple back. It is no joke to persevere for more than 500 years. You don't even know who started it. Our temple has been destroyed. We will go and work for it. They died. The next generation, the next generation, the next generation, they persevered. It is no joke. 500 years. Does anybody know in their own family there is a, there is a law, um, you know, there is a court case on some land property going on for 500 years? Who does that? Right? This is perseverance par excellence. Understand to win in life, to understand from history, we have to learn from Ayodhya. We have to learn from the people who fought. Perseverance. It is a privilege to be alive today and now and see the temple almost into completion. Bhagwan Ram's dignity is being restored. And with the dignity of Bhagwan Ram, so is the dignity of Hindus being restored. Our dignity, our, our um, identity, these are very important facts that will help us. We often undermine what these are, but these are like the, um, the board on which we, the, the floor on which we stand, right? 
the last point that I'm going to talk about is, you know, why is this relevant? Is because it upholds dharm. Remember, if the good and the virtuous do not fight and uphold dharm, like in the case of the kings of Ayodhya until now that we have been fighting, so whether it's Manu, Ikshwaku, Sagar, um, you know, uh, so for those of you who do not know, Asit was a king from, uh, from the dynasty who uh, lost Ayodhya and he was thrown into the jungle. Then his son Sagar got it back, right? And from after Sagar, there were many kings and then there was Raghu, there was Bhagirathi and then Bhagwan Ram, right? They relentlessly fought and uphold, upheld dharm for their people, for their land, for, for their own dignity. We have to remember that if the good and the virtuous do not fight and uphold dharm, the adharmis are not going to give us a break and stop doing adharma. Absolutely not. Perpetrators of violence, and this is a psychological fact, perpetrators of violence may experience fatigue, but like all adharmis, they will be relentless. They will be relentless against whom? They'll be relentless against the dharmics. Therefore, like Ram, we have to build one trait in us, and that is to be indefatigable. Because Ram was indefatigable in war, this is the reason why Sita was abducted. Because when single-handedly he killed all the demons, all the Rakshas, 14,000 of them from Janasthan, the first battle with him was with Janasthan, 14,000 of them he killed himself, single-handedly. They say he, not only was he super talented, he was also indefatigable. What does this mean? What does talent mean? Talent means he knows which weapon to use on whom, and he knows how to do it. They say that he was so fast, and with both hands, he would shoot so fast that you could not see his hands only. This is how good he was. It is like the fan, you put the fan on full speed. Can you see the, 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 the wings of the fan? You can't. And so you couldn't see Ram's hands when he was firing or when he was shooting the bows and arrows. When he was shooting the arrows, he couldn't see. So that is talent. But you could be talent for, talented for 10 minutes. For example, you could be a sprinter. But he was not a sprinter. He was indefatigable. So he could do that for days and days and days. You, he would get arrows. Nothing would happen. So when the Rakshas saw this, they were so afraid. They ran. And they told Ravan, listen, this man, he can, he can finish this whole civilization himself single-handedly. And he can also create it. He is so powerful. And the most dangerous thing is he is indefatigable. Understand, if you are indefatigable, the enemy is going to be scared of you. Nobody wants to mess with a man who they know will not leave you. So, he, so, so Ravan is very scared. He says, oh my God, what do we do now? What do we do? And he says, Janasthana is finished. Now it's you. So what do you do? So let's kidnap his wife. Why? Because you, there's nothing he's afraid of. His life resides in his wife. Let's abduct her, he's going to die himself. He's going to fall on his knees. And what that means is fall on his knees is that he's going to die. So why I'm telling you this story, and then this is where they made the mistake. They thought by taking her, they are going to kill Ram. But what Ram does instead is that he says, because of the chal that has been done to me. What is the chal? The chal is you didn't fight man to man to take my wife. If you wanted the woman, fight man, man to man. You took her by deceit. And for the deceit that Ravan has done to me, the king of Rakshasas, the best amongst them, I am going to wipe out the whole of the Rakshas race from the face of this earth. And so there he goes and wipes them off. And this one trait, indefatigable, because talent is not enough. It is this trait that all dharmic people should have indefatigable is 
the most important point why Ayodhya is relevant today. The battle between dharm and adharm has never stopped. And for dharm to win, each and every time it has to be indefatigable. Okay? Now, those were the five key points. And I'm going to come to why is Ayodhya amazing. So some of the points that I'm going to tell you here are in my book, and two points are not from the book, right? For that, you'll have to read the Valmiki Ramayana or wait for my next book. So one of the top reasons why Ayodhya is amazing, and the first reason is something that you would have never thought of. The first reason is Ayodhya is constructed as a purely military city. And hardly anybody tells you that. There is this notion that Ayodhya is this spiritual city and it is so spiritual that nobody can attack it. But that could not be further away from truth. truth. Ayodhya is a military city and it were because it was designed so. Valmiki says the same in the Valmiki Ramayan, for example, and, and how does he say it? So what and what examples does Valmiki give? What is a military city? Please understand the words a plus yudhya. A in Sanskrit, Ayodhya is made up of a sandhi of a and yudhya. Whenever we put a in front of a, 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 any word, that means that cannot be. So a yudhya means that cannot be won in war, that is unassailable, that is unattackable, you can't defeat it. Let's say, for example, the word amit, a plus mit, that which cannot die, right? Ajar, a plus jar, that never grows old, right? So similarly, we have ayodhya, that which cannot ever be won, that which is unassailable, right? So what is the proof that Valmiki gives us? So he says, there is a moat outside ayodhya which is impassable by animals. It is so deep and it is so wide, animals cannot cross it. Are? So there is a durg, so what? Animals cannot cross it. Today, in today's world, it makes no sense to us, right? But in earlier times, the, the armies of the past were very interesting armies. They were called Chaturangi armies. So they were called Chaturang. What is Chaturang? Chatur means four in Sanskrit. And ang means, ang means limbs. So, one army, one sena, which has four limbs, what are the limbs? The first limb is infantry. No army is ever complete without an infantry, right? Soldiers, foot soldiers, padati. Second is cavalry, horsemen. There you go, horsemen. Third is rat. Uh, Arjun or when uh, uh, Bhagwan Krishna was in the war, he was in the war. After that, he was in the war. He was in the war. Right? When Alexander's armies were invading, Chanakya had a huge uh, you know, rumor that the elephants were so dangerous that some of the men who uh, you know, saw the elephants were so faint. Kar gaye. <laughs> you know, they were so afraid because they had never seen the elephant, right? And he, he was a great propagandist. So, he said, the elephant is like this, like this, and he was like this, and he was So, these are the four limbs of the typical ancient army, Chaturang. Now, apart from infantry, all three limbs have animals in it. And so, what does Ayodhya have to protect itself? It has a big moat. No animal can cross it. So any invading army, the three-fourth of that invading army cannot reach Ayodhya. Right? This is a very typical military design. I'm sorry to interrupt, ma'am. Uh, yeah. So I think we need to conclude. And OK. Yes. So this is a very interesting design that we have of uh, Ayodhya. Right? And then he goes on to say more things. Uh, like he says, there is a, there is, and beyond the moat, he says, there is uh, a jungle of sal trees. So I'll just read out one shlok. So he says, Sa yojane cha dwe bhuya ha satyanama prakashate yasyam dashratho raja vasan jagat apalyat. So what does this mean? Vaha pe jo, vaha ayodhya me jo vaste hai raja, uh, raja dashrat, wo us jagha us nagri ke jo satyanama prakashate. So what is satyanama? What is true to its name? So true to its name, a yudhya jisse koi lad nahi sakta hai. 
So this is the most and the most interesting facet, the most interesting and the most intriguing facet of Ayodhya. And I'm going to hurry up with the next uh, uh, points, right? So Ayodhya is then based on Vastu Shastra. It is totally Vastu compliant. And today, you know, from that time to this time, it is totally va Vastu compliant. I mean, today also we value Vastu compliant houses. It is, it is engineered in such a manner that it follows a grid pattern network of roads. What is the grid pattern of net network of roads? So these are the kind of roads that you find in New York. Abu Dhabi. And uh, one of the cities in India you have it is Chandigarh. So what this does is that it enables you to move very smoothly across the city. Many Indian cities, including Delhi, Bombay, they are not made of this pattern. So our ancients were so intelligent that they devised the grid pattern that we, we, you know, we now see the West using it, right? Then there is this very mysterious weapon called Shatagni. This weapon is placed on the ramparts. And it's a very interesting weapon because the word Shatagni itself means a killer of hundreds. And Ayodhya's identity is made up of the Shatagni because Valmiki says hundreds and hundreds of them are on the ramparts. Why are they there? Because they have to protect, because people will attack. So we, you, we need to have it. And so the, the, the weapon is also very intriguing. And researchers can never find out exactly what this weapon is. So in my book, I've decoded it. I'm going to go to the next point. You can take the book and read what this weapon is. Now, these are the two points that is not in the book. The ministers of Ayodhya and the Dashrath himself and the minister of, uh, uh, ministers of Ayodhya are Doordarshi. What is Doordarshi? Dur means far away. So whether far away in terms of time, that, you know, in the future or whether far away, let's say in far lands, let's say Japan, China, you know, from where we are. So what does this mean? This means that they are able to know what is happening in far lands, what has already happened, and what will happen in the future. Is this some magical power? <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. If you know what is going to happen, what has happened, and what will happen in the future, is this some magical power? No, it's not. It's a simple and a very complex and an amazing uh, network of spies. So they have so many spies all over that they know anything and everything that is going to happen. So kings who had these many spies were said that they have many eyes. So for example, Indra has 1,000 eyes, right? So that means he has more than a thousand network of spies. And so Ayodhya is this really powerful city, and it has spies all over the world. So they are in control. They, they know everything that's going on, right? Then the last point is the soldiers of Ayodhya. So the soldiers of Ayodhya, Valmiki says, they are like lions guarding a cave. Ah, there's one cave, and there are many lions. So you can imagine. Now, these people are so well-trained and are such excellent soldiers. They're skilled at archery. They're skilled at combat skills. Nobody can defeat them. They're so good. They're so talented. Nobody can even taunt them or misbehave with them. Because if you taunt them and, and misbehave with them, you're going to incur wrath. So that brings you respect, and that also shows their talent. right? So with this, this was the last point. And there are many, many, many more reasons that make Ayodhya amazing. And again, those are given in the book. I don't have the time to talk uh, all about it. OK? Do read the book. Do buy it. It's at the stall. There are only a few copies at the stall uh, outside. And also give it to those people who will appreciate it, who will feel pride, who want to know about our itihas. Because I've just explained five reasons why Ayodhya is valid even today, why must, we must know about it. And it has to be a source of pride for all of us, right? And um, so that's it. With this, I would uh, finish my uh, talk. Thank you to Prabhu Bharat for organizing this event and giving me the opportunity to share my passion with this wonderful audience. Jai Shri Ram, thank you. धन्यवाद नीना जी आपका बहुत वंडरफुल स्पीच रहा और जैसे हम लोग सुन रहे थे नीना जी को एक बात बहुत स्पष्ट तरीके से आ रही थी कि there are so many things which are hidden in the city of Ayodhya and then if I would like to connect what Ayodhya has to offer in terms of IKS 
there was a Rajya Shastra, there was Artha Shastra, there was Nyaya Shastra. There are so many Shastras which uh, Ayodhya was a manifestation of. And when it comes to uh, Lord Ram, Sri Ram, is himself was a personification of values, virtues, uh, all in one. So that's how uh, Sri Ram became the Adarsh uh, and then uh, was called to be the Maryada Purushottam. So we could see the glimpse of all the knowledge Indian knowledge system by studying just one city that is Ayodhya. It's not just one city uh, if I am, this is a wrong statement, but it's, it's everything in it. So likewise, India has a treasure of knowledge if we go to every corner of India. So uh, with this, I would like to throw open the session for quick uh, question and answer uh, from the audience so that we can uh, conclude the session. So uh, the volunteers, if you could please mo move the mic for just quick questions. Hari Om. My question is to Bhatji. Uh, Indian calendar is the most scientific calendar, yet we have been following Georgian calendar. Can India as a civilized state not, not follow its own calendar? My question is why? Uh, we are actually following it. Aren't you following the Chaitra Vaishakha? You are, uh, you are following Yugadi? Yes, sir. But we are following it, but uh, as an official thing, we but have not yet February. started. Uh, that needs some time. First, we have to develop our knowledge about the calendar. Without that development, we c first we have to appreciate our uh, yes, calendar. Sir. Once that I starts... I, I, I was very happy, happy there, sir. The, then I, I seen the after that. Okay. That you showed me that calendar. Yeah, for all these, it's I was just discussing about Vara here, that's uh, weekdays. For Tithi, for Nakshatra, everything has a scientific answer. How that Nakshatra, every day we say this, today it is Ashwini Nakshatra, today it is Prathama Tithi. How that comes? It has a math mathematical calculations for each of them. Even Chaitra Vaishakha, the masas which we are saying, that has a mathematical calculation. So everything has a scientific reasoning when we speak about this uh, Indian calendar, Panchanga, five angas, Tithi Vara Nakshatra Yoga and Karana, Tithi Vara Nakshatra Yoga and Karana. These are five angas in Panchanga. So when we discuss this Panchanga, this is uh, you ha we have to first understand that there is some scientific thing. We have to read it. We have to understand. Then we have to start following it. Just because, see, the August, July, the months which we are practicing now, they are because of some kings. Because that king ruled at that time, he wanted his name to be uh, known by the world, so he named that part of the year as July, Julius Caesar. So he gave July, Augustus, he gave August. So this way that uh, the modern names came. But our names, Chitra Nakshatra, falls at that time, that's why it's called Chaitra. Chaitra, Vaishakha, Vishakha Nakshatra falls at that time, that's why it's called Vishakha. Vaishakha uh, month which we say. So every month has a reasoning in our calendar. Only thing we have to understand and bring into practice. Uh, to answer your question, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the Prime Minister's office has adopted this. So when something from the Prime Minister's office comes out, as far as I know, or some government entity, they now write the Indian Tithi as well, like Saka, or, you know, like we follow Vikram Sambath, so it is there. And uh, so what if we don't put it in the, um, you know, on our daily life, we don't use it. But I highly recommend that everybody keeps a panchang at home. You can take any panchang. Let's say, for example, I use Kal Nirnay. So, you know, you know when which season is coming. You will know how, you know, when uh, spring will come, you will know. So use it as, as personal, even if it's not, have. It's, it's an important thing for everybody to have in the house. Yeah, to add, Hindu calendar is an app. You can use that app also if you want. Yeah, yeah. So it use has it. I, I've been all. I've been using yeah. it, and it's been really great because <laughs> yes. I know this year summer is going to come early. Why? Because Vasant uh, Panchmi was on 26 January, so <laughs> you know this will come early. You know exactly when uh, you know the rain will start because it'll say. So it's very useful to determine these you know basic things. Uh, okay. Hariyom, uh, my question is to Ji. 
Vedas is the like knowledge of universe, and it is a Purusha, which is not written by any without help of human being. So, wanted to know who has written the Vedas and all, and where it has been originated. See, as per our uh, tradition or our Shraddha, we say Vedas are apaurusheya, means it's not written. Uh, our rishis have contemplated, they meditated upon it, and the thoughts were seen in there. They saw it, the mantra in that form. They saw it. For example, uh, Vishwamitra, he meditated, he contemplated, and he saw Gayatri Mantra. Gayatri Mantra, that uh, why it is called Gayatri, it's a different thing. Gayatri is a meter. So there are many mantras in Vedas which are in that meter. But this is specifically called Gayatri because it's the most powerful of all the Gayatri Mantras. But as I said, it's meditated and contemplated. That's why it has no author. We believe there is no author for it. But in case if you want to find some author, we'll say Vishwamitra is an author for... If you want to name some author, Vishwamitra is the person who saw it, so he's an author. In the Vedas, just to add to that, in the Vedas, so whenever you see a particular mantra, it is always written in a chand. So for example, I, I think you meant to say Gayatri is a chand. So Anushtup chand, Gayatri chand, these are chands. So this is the meter. This is how the verses are coded. But if you read the whole thing, you will know that the person who is you know, either deciphering it or who has penned it down, their name is also there in the Vedas. You read it, you will see the shlokas, whatever they are giving. They say so and so, so and so, so and so has done it. Okay. All of them, all, all, all have the authors' names in it. Uh, thank you so much, audience. Uh, I appreciate you have many questions to be asked, uh, but certainly we will entertain your questions and pass it on to the uh, experts, uh, speakers here, and then we will uh, definitely get the answers to you uh, in uh, days to come. And uh, before I just conclude uh, the session here, I just want to give one concluding remark that to get into Indian knowledge system, yato Bharatiya Dnyan Parampara agar hume janna hai, it may take a lifetime lifetime of a person. So we have one person who is uh, doctor in the form of uh, Dr. Vinayak Bharji, who is there to educate our yuva as uh, assistant professor who is specialized in uh, IKS, though he doesn't want to accept it. But still, at the awareness level, he is uh, doing the wonderful job. And we have one more speaker who has actually spent her uh, significant time in researching one part of IKS uh, in the form uh, of her research and then brought out a book. So you can imagine, uh, we have to do a kind of reverse engineering in our own area, what we know. If I am coming from the area of management, then I have to go back and see what Indian knowledge man management system, uh, Indian knowledge system has for me as a management teacher. So likewise, if you are a student of commerce, if you are a student of engineering, Go back and see, find your own um, way out to understand what our system has to offer so that we are very proud of our identity and we al also know that Indian knowledge system uh, is all uh, inclusive and then giving the knowledge to all of us. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, many were asking how to uh, know Indian knowledge system. There is one book which uh, uh, AICT funded book. Uh, Introduction to Indian Knowledge System, Concepts and Applications, published by PHI. It's a, uh, it's a researched book. Uh, I am one of the author of that book. Professor B. Mahadevan is the author. I am the co-author. So that book actually gives enough details for young minds who really want to go ahead for the research. So PHI Learning has published that book. Thank you. ಈ ಅವಧಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಭಾರತೀಯ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಪರಂಪರೆ ಮತ್ತು ಮೇಲೆಳೆತ್ತಿರುವ ಭವ್ಯ ಭಾರತದ ಪ್ರತೀಕವಾದ ಸಾರಿ ಅಯೋಧ್ಯೆಯ ಕುರಿತು ವಿಷಯ ಮಂಡಿಸಿದ ಅತಿಥಿಗಳಿಬ್ಬರಿಗೂ ಯುವ ಪ್ರಬುದ್ಧ ಭಾರತದ ಪರವಾಗಿ ಸ್ಮರಣಿಕೆ ನೀಡಿ ಗೌರವಿಸಬೇಕೆಂದು ಈ ಅವಧಿಯ ಸಂಚಾಲಕಿಯಾದ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶೈಲಜಾ ಹಿರೇಮಟ್ಟಿವರನ್ನು ವಿನಂತಿಸುತ್ತೇವೆ ಧನ್ಯವಾದಗಳು 
Um, so um, thank you so much for being such a wonderful audience. For those of you who want signed copies of the book, I'll go sign them. If you buy them, I'll sign them outside. So please feel free to approach me with your book and get it signed. Thank you. <laughs>